Welcome everyone. Today I'm going to talk about Monero Sybil attacks. Sybil attacks are a very interesting network-wide attack that is absolutely not unique to Monero. It's something that all cryptocurrencies encounter in some form, but it's still very important that the Monero community focuses on how to best protect the transaction broadcast procedure. The Sybil attack refers to a method by which attackers may attempt to either block transactions or they may attempt to learn more information about transactions. In this specific case, we are interested in an attacker potentially learning more about a sender's IP address. So let's jump ahead and go through some examples here. So it's important to note that Monero uses Dandelion++, which is best illustrated here on the left, as opposed to Flood um, as its default transaction broadcast procedure. Now, the Monero uh, wallets will default, uh, so it will fall back on using Flood if necessary, if it notes that there's something incorrect with the transaction broadcast, but the majority of transactions are broadcast with Dandelion++. Let's go over a little bit how this works. Dandelion++ is named based off the way the transaction broadcast looks like. It looks like a dandelion, and I tried to replicate that here. Let's say that this brown circle is the initial origin node. This is where the transaction is coming from, and it needs to make its way to the rest of the nodes on the network such that it can be included in the next block. Instead of directly sending all, you know, the, the broadcast to all of the nodes that this uh, origin node is familiar with, as you can see in this flood example, with Dandelion++, the node will choose a specific path. It will first send it to one node, which will then send it to another node, and then send it to another node. This process here is known as the stem phase, the stem being a very thin layer of nodes that learn information about the transaction before it is fluffed or broadcast to the rest of the nodes. At a certain point, once it is a certain distance away from the original sending node, a node is given the instruction to send the transaction to as many other nodes as possible that it knows about. So that's why the fluff phase is important at getting the transaction out there, and the stem helps keep it a little bit further away from the origin node than would be uh, the case with a flood transaction broadcast. As I mentioned, Monero uses Dandelion++ for the vast majority of its transfers and only uses Flood as a fallback, just because in the majority of the cases when everything goes well, this substantially improves privacy because none of the nodes that you, you know, None of the nodes here necessarily know that you are the original node sending the transaction. Each of these green dots does not necessarily know whether they are the first, second, or you know any other number on this stem process. They just know they're receiving a transaction with the instruction to send it to someone else. The fluff uh, node, of course, knows that they are not the final, sorry, not the uh, the first node to receive the transaction, but of course, of course, they're quite a few hops away from knowing anything about the original sending node, so they're pretty good also. So what are the two steps that attackers can take to try and do a Sybil attack? Bearing in mind that this is only one example of a Sybil attack, there are plenty of other types of Sybil attacks. In general, a Sybil attack just means some method of trying to disrupt people in some way. In this case, however, we're assuming that the attacker wants to learn the real IP address of the sender. So for more from a privacy perspective than just a, an annoying broadcast perspective. Well, what they can first do is try and snoop the broadcasts. This is something that you will want to do as an attacker. You know, whether or not you want to take an aggressive or passive view, this is something that you will be doing. Um, and then if you want to take a more aggressive view, what you can do as an attacker is you can also cut off the stem. You can say, well, if you're somewhere in this green or yellow nodes, you can just refuse to broadcast as instructed. And that could, um, you know, have implications as we're going to describe here. So again, let's zoom in on this, this case. Um, let's now assume that one of the attackers has a node but it's in one of these nodes that only receives the transaction during the fluff phase. Um, well, since IP addresses are not stored on the blockchain ever, we know that the attacker is only able to know where they in particular got the transaction from. 
they got it from this node and so they learn the IP address of this node. Of course, however, this IP address is not the same node that originally sent the transaction. These are completely different entities. So the attacker's best guess as to who sent the transaction is this yellow node, which has this IP, which is of course very different than the user that originally sent it. So this IP address is not the real sender that sent this Monero transaction. What if they find their way in the stem phase somehow? And of course, it's it's usually pretty difficult to determine whether or not nodes are acting maliciously or if they're acting legitimately, but they're also snooping information. So they're, they're following all the rules of the network, but it's really difficult to detect that they're doing additional nefarious behavior on the side. Well, in this case, the attacker would know the IP that they received the transaction from, this green node here. But of course, again, this green node is not the originating node in the transaction. They are just one node that was selected in the dandelion stem phase. So therefore, the attacker associating this IP with this transaction is also not quite legitimate. This transaction was certainly not sent by this node. This node merely received the transaction and further relayed it. But what the attacker might do is instead of carrying the instruction and sending it out to the uh, to the fluff node such that it's able to get out to the rest of the network, they may block the transaction. Note, of course, that this is detectable. If you are, if a particular node is constantly blocking transactions, then you can assume that it's nefarious and you should do what you can to avoid it in the future. Um, so there are some other advanced attacks where the attacker will not broadcast, block the transfer. And so therefore they will simply uh, relay it without interfering and still collect information. There's no way to prevent this. But let's say that the transaction doesn't pr propagate further and it just gets stuck here. The attacker effectively cuts off the uh, stem of this transaction broadcast. So the original node will sit around for a little bit and then say, hey, it hasn't really shown up in the mempool. No one's mined it. What's going on with my transaction? Maybe it didn't really get out there properly. So they will attempt to broadcast the transaction through the normal flood method. So they will send their uh, transaction broadcast to quite a few other nodes instead of just this really narrow path, just so that it has the best chance of getting out there. Well, an attacker could potentially interfere in this process in several ways too. First, let's say they might control one of these nodes and they may directly receive the transaction broadcast from you. Now, the attacker doesn't necessarily know, in this case, which of these two IP addresses is the real one. They both could have been the or, or, uh, sorry, originating node, but with a substantial number of nodes, an attacker can get an increasingly good idea on network uh, behavior once they, once they get a hold of what, what people are really doing on the network. Um, also, let's say that instead of the attacker directly receiving the broadcast, maybe it relays to someone else first and then they get it again. So now they have two different IP addresses that are not the real uh, IP address of the original sender, but they are still some information that might potentially get them a little bit closer. Let's say if a node prioritizes connecting to um, other nodes that have a strong connection or strong performance, well, then those might be certain, like geographically located near the user, and so perhaps the attacker might learn some additional information about the original sender, but certainly not as much as if it learned the original IP address. And of course, in none of these cases does the attacker definitively know what the originating IP address is, because there's a bunch of other methods that could have potentially occurred. So how do we best avoid the case where a user directly sends funds to uh, the attacker? Well, sorry, by that, uh, sorry, well, the user directly tr broadcasts the transaction to the attacker, isn't that necessarily sending the money, sorry. So one thing that users can do is use Tor or I2P, I'm using Tor here as an example, in order to better obfuscate the information that is sent. So sure, your node may originally intend to send this attacker node the IP uh, the uh, transaction broadcast first um, as a first step in the transaction stem process however if you're using Tor it may not matter that the first node or any node in the process really is an attacker node because you're better protecting your IP address so let's zoom in on what this specifically looks like so instead of you directly sending a transfer from your node directly to the attacker's node, if you're using an anonymizing network such as Tor, you will instead first send 
uh, the transaction uh, broadcast through these Tor relay nodes, and then finally you'll get to a Tor exit node, which will then finally send the transaction broadcast to the attacker node. Well, in this case, the IP address that the attacker learns is not your IP address. They learn the IP address of the exit node, which of course has no relation to you. So as a result, using Tor can substantially improve the privacy of your transfers, though of course it comes with some user experience drawback just because it takes longer. And of course it requires users to set up Tor. Now, of course, let's say the attacker blocks this again. Well, you can go through the process of doing flood again, but if you try to do flood through Tor, of course, you're better protected uh, than if you were trying to do flood through you know, complete clear net. Um, so there are some benefits to using Tor. There are other disadvantages to using Tor, but if your priority is privacy, Tor is something that you should definitely consider using. Other alternatives, of course, include I2P or uh, a trusted VPN if you do trust any of the VPN providers out there. Now, I also want to note that there is a substantial difference between the node that broadcasts the transaction and the wallet that you are using. If you are using a common wallet such as Cake Wallet, Monoruyo, My Monero, or even the official Monero GUI or CLI, you may be using a remote node. So what happens is you may you know, live at your home and you may send a transfer. The transfer to the rest of the network doesn't necessarily come from your home IP. It may come from whatever node you are connected to. So let's say I'm using the uh, you know Monoruyo uh, USA Cake Wallet. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the Cake Wallet uh, node here that that I'm I'm uh, circling with with a pointer. So what happens is my wallet will send the transaction broadcast to this node only. And then Cake Wallet will begin the Dandelion plus plus or flood process from there. So I am trusting in that case for Cake Wallet to uh, to to protect my IP address, I suppose. So Cake Wallet is able to associate whatever IP address I give them a transfer to with the transfer because they know that they are the very beginning of the transaction pro uh, broadcast process because you are requesting that they broadcast a transaction for them. Same goes for any other type of node you use. So using a remote node may protect you against certain behaviors, but of course, note that you are trusting the remote node in the process. So by assigning trust to the remote node, you're able to avoid many of these other concerns, but of course, you need to trust the entity to let that happen. If you want to learn more about timing attacks in general or other network related attacks, I strongly recommend that you check out the Breaking Monero series. It is, it is on the Monero Community Workgroup channel. Um, one that covers the most similar attacks as this one is episode eight, which goes over timing attacks. Um, and then of course, I want to reiterate one last time that the Monero network is not the only network that is subject to Sybil attacks. And in fact, Monero implemented Dandelion++ specifically to best protect the privacy of its users uh, that are sending transfers. Uh, Dandelion++ substantially improves the privacy protections uh, on a network level compared to not using Dandelion++. And it's awesome because Dandelion++ is able to be implemented even if users don't go through the process of configuring something like Tor or I2P. So Monero really does provide a good level of network uh, IP address protection uh, on you know by, by default at least compared to other coins but it is not a silver bullet and there certainly are ways for attackers to try and learn information about you so if you are really interested in protecting your IP address it is important that you learn how the Monero transaction bro uh, broadcast process works and best protect yourself as uh, makes sense for you. All right, that's been all I wanted to cover today. I hope that it was useful for you to cover Sybil attacks on a high level. Uh, we'll catch you again in a future video. Take care.